How many of you out there can read the third line here? Raise your hand. Okay. Okay. How many of you can read the fifth line? Raise your hand. Wow. I like that. How many of you can read the seventh line? Raise your hand. Okay. You're not raising your hand over there, Kurt. Uh, how about the last line? How many of you can read the last line? Okay. Now the big question. The big question. How many of you can read the chart? All right. Of God. If you're reading the chart with good vision, it says there's a message in this eye chart. Evaluate your true spiritual act of worship. I believe in the book of Romans, especially chapter 12, it is Paul who's making an appeal to Christians, people like you. And like me. And in his appeal. And when there is an appeal I should say. An evaluation must take place. Uh, Let me share this. How many of you would say you are a Christian? Raise your hand if you say you're a Christian. Okay. Now I'm going to get a little deeper. But I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. How many of you would say you're a committed Christian? Hmm. Yeah. Okay. That takes a little more than just raising your hand. It takes an evaluation. Meaning you really have to evaluate your true, not make believe, your true spiritual worship of God. Now, Paul has this group of Christians And I'm just going to say, they're stuck. It's a church at Rome. And he's writing this letter to straighten out a few things. Now, one of them is, you know, they were Gentiles. Now, when Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount, most of those folks were Jewish heritage, maybe a few Gentiles. But Paul is writing to the church at Rome, and there may be a few Jews, but most of them are Gentiles, the Romans. And so he's speaking to them and trying to comfort them with the gospel and the good news. And he says, now listen, what's important is not that you have Jewish heritage, not that you can say, I'm from Abraham's seed. What is important is what God has done for you. He has welcomed you into the, his family and made you a part of who he is. Now, some of those Romans might be thinking, well, you know, the Jews think they're better than us. And we're just the Gentiles. And Paul tries to explain it to them, the mercies of God, the grace and the love of God. And he really does that by giving... Uh, the description of a tree. Now, I hope you'll go home and read chapters 9, 10, and 11 before this 12th chapter of Romans. And he says, okay, there's a tree and all the branches are broken off. And then over here is another wild tree, an olive tree, and the branches are broken off. The gardener comes in basically and grafts. Scientifically, we know this is possible. You can graft the branch of another tree, as long as it's not completely dead, into another tree. And he says, listen, that's what's happened. God has grafted you into his tree. And how much more are the branches that were broken off to be grafted back into the original tree? See, sin breaks us off from God. The branches do not support the tree. The tree supports the branches. And he continues this thought. And he speaks to the Romans and says, this is something we need to celebrate. We are all one. There's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female. We are part of Israel. Let me put it another way. There is 
Israel. And then there's true Israel, true believers. There is the children of God. And then there are those who are children of God. Martin Luther describes it this way. There is what we know as the visible church, right? Oh, all these people, all these churches, all these buildings. And then there is what is the invisible church that we can't see, the true believers. It's not everybody. It is a remnant, Paul talks. And he says to those Gentiles, you're part of the remnant. Let me tell you how John describes it. He describes the whole Old Testament in one sentence. A true light that is the light of every person was coming into the world. Old Testament, one sentence. And then he goes to the New Testament, puts it basically in, in one sentence. He says, that light came into the world and though he made the world... The world did not know him. He came to his own. Jesus was Jewish. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. But to those, that means those in the world. That's a lot of people. To those that received him, he gave the right to be called children of God. Children not born of a father's will. Or of flesh and blood, but born of God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only son. Full of grace and truth. You see, there, there is this group. But within that group is a remnant that are true believers. Remember Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Hey, the highway is huge, the gate is huge, and a lot of people are going to perdition. But the road is narrow, the door is small, and not many go through the door. That's the remnant. And Paul was celebrating with the Romans and saying, you are a part of it. Let me explain it another way. Let's say that COVID-19 was 100% fatal. And let's say everybody in the world is going to get it or has it. 100% fatal. And let's say a doctor in America discovers a vaccine. And he stands up and says, I have the vaccine. And the people in America say, uh, we don't know you. We don't even like you. We don't want your vaccine. But a few, a small group says, okay, we'll take it. That doctor says, well, I'm going to Mexico. And he goes to Mexico and there's a large group there, not everybody, who says, hey, I want part of that vaccine. And they receive it. And then he says, I'm going to Canada. In Canada, there are people who receive it, but not everybody in Canada. And then he comes back to America and there's a few people in America kind of jealous because Canada has a vaccine. Mexico has a vaccine. We'll receive the vaccine too. Paul talks about... The Gentiles receiving grace makes the Jews jealous. Okay, Now, that person wants to save America. And let's say everybody in the world dies except those who are vaccinated. The doctor could literally say, I saved America. I saved Mexico. I saved Canada. And that, that would be true. Now you understand, when the Bible proclaims, Jesus came to save Israel, and he saved Israel. Who's, what's Israel? Israel is everybody, God's people. And the Israel are those who received what he was offering, the vaccination to sin. And that's why Paul, right before tw chapter 12, he says, listen, listen to these words. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on them. The common denominator that all Gentiles and Jews, male and female, let me put it this way. You know how you fight racism? Not from the top down, but from the bottom up. Ever heard of, all men are created equal? Isn't that what we proclaim in America? Where does that come from? The Bible. 
In the beginning, God created. But Paul says we're all equal in chapter 11. We're equal in the eyes of God because we're all disobedient. We're all sinners. You see, when we realize down here, we're all together. We're all sinners. We're all going to die. We all have the COVID sinful nature. That's how you realize that we've all been grafted into one tree and we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And then he celebrates and says, oh, the depth, the riches, the wisdom, and the knowledge. That's something to celebrate and say, hallelujah. hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And then he goes on and says, listen, everything is through him and in him and to him. And he's trying to Get the church at Rome excited because they were kind of in a rut. And then he says, okay, this is it. He says, I appeal to you. He's making an appeal, not a command. I appeal, appeal to you there, beseech you therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God. You know these mercies. You've been grafted in. You've been included. You're part of God's children, God's family. You know what God has done for you. See, he's talking to the church, not unbelievers, not pagans. He's talking to you, 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 and me. You know your past. You know what God has done for you. I appeal to you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. We say, oh, I'm doing it here. I'm worshiping. No. He's talking about your entire life, your body. That's body, mind, and soul. And it, see... He's saying, are, are you Christians, followers of Jesus? Okay, that's an appeal. Now, off your bodies. And that takes, you can't do that without an evaluation. You just can not. Let me give you an example. Memorial Day was a month ago, right? If you've heard this story about a Memorial Day service in a church, I'm sorry, but I'm going to tell it again because stories are so important. There was a couple on Memorial Day, in their church, they wanted their son to be remembered because he died in the war, protecting our nation. And on Memorial Day, the family came up, the name of the son was mentioned, and the mom and dad gave a gift in honor of their son so that he would be remembered, the mercy and the grace of God would be remembered, who gave him a son. And it was a very tearful, emotional service when the gift was given and the amount was mentioned. There was a couple who were in the congregation and the mother nudged the father and said, let us give a gift, but let's double it. And the husband, turned to his wife who made that appeal and he had to do some evaluating and he said why should we give a gift in memory of our three sons they are alive and well and haven't fought in any war and the mother looked at the father her husband and said that's exactly why because we have three healthy, vibrant, living sons who've never fought in a war. And after that evaluation, he got out his checkbook and wrote a check. Hmm. You see, an appeal is made by Paul. An appeal requires an evaluation. Have you evaluated your Christianity recently? Last night, some of you were here. It was an honor, oh, an honor here at Ablaze when the staff of Camp Luther Homa comes and worships with us. And uh, some 20 young folks were right over there. And I looked at them and I said, hey, why are you working as staff at camp this year? They don't. I said, are you here to have a good time at camp and meet boys and girls? And I said, if that's why you're at camp, on staff, to meet boys and girls and have fun, well, good luck. I don't think you're going to have that. I said, but if you're at camp, on staff, because God has done so many things 
in your life and made such a difference and gave you such wonderful parents and you realize that you can make a difference in the lives of some child who may not even know Jesus. If that's the reason you're on Stafford camp, I said, look out, you're going to have one great summer. <laughs> Why? Because that's the reasonable spiritual worship. It's what we do for God. You see, parents, grandparents, you don't have to die for your children to get to heaven. Grandparents, you don't have to die so your grandchildren can get to heaven. Nobody here has to die for themselves to get to heaven. Why? Because there was a father who sent his son, Jesus, who paid that price. He made available a vaccine for each and every one of us. And Paul is making an appeal to the church. Let me say that again. Paul is making an appeal to you and I to evaluate. To just stop and say, hmm, let me make a statement. The Christian church is big. But to the true Christians within the Christian church, I'm going to make a statement. The church is not dying. Some of you may know the numbers of churches, especially maybe around here or in especially the traditional churches. Membership is going down. I'm going to make a statement. The church is not dying, but from my heart, I'm going to make an appeal. The church is failing. You see, people out there, you know what they're looking for? They're looking for something to enhance their life. Something to make their life better. Fulfilling. Which you have. Because you have Jesus. But they're looking for it. What they're not looking for is some place where they bicker about what should be. How things should be done. Oh, the church isn't dying. The church is failing. And we have to always reevaluate ourselves. Paul, 2,000 years ago, was saying, all right, you guys, reevaluate yourself. I said this at the church uh, in Tulsa, our Savior, and I'm going to share it here. And I, I've shared this story before, but, you know, when a story is good, repeat it. It's a story about... A fictitious story, of course. And I'm going to use a blaze for it. There was a person who came to a blaze. And he had a cowboy hat on. And he sat down. And one of the ushers, Bobby Moore, walked up and said, Sir, here at the blaze, we respect God's house. And please take off your hat. The person said, Hey, Bobby, I thank you. It's nice to meet you. Thank you for introducing my, yourself. And he kept his hat on. Bobby went to Don Cook. Said, Don, listen, this guy with his cowboy hat on, can you do something about it? He just not taking it on. Don Cook went up and said, hi, I'm, I'm part of the leadership team here at Ablaze. And I'm Don Cook. And introduced himself. He said, sir, you know, we just take our hat off out of respect for this building and what's done here. And would you please take your hat off? Oh, thank you so much for, oh, Don, it's nice to meet you. And he left his hat on. So what did Don Cook do? He went to find Dr. Spomer. Dr. Spomer walks up and says, I am Dr. Spomer. I've been a pastor for over 45 years. We respect God's house. And would you, sir, just please take your hat off and say, oh, nice to meet you, Dr. Spomer. He left his hat on. 
Well, the service began. Dr. Spomer got up front and said, We begin in the name of God. And he took his hat off. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And he left his hat off the whole service. After the service, meeting and greeting, that person walked up to Dr. Spomer and said, You know, Dr. Spomer, this is a miracle hat. Said it is. Said, yes, this is a hat of miracles. I've been coming to this church for th three months now. And because of this hat, I met an usher for the first time. He introduced himself to me. I met a leader of this church, Don Cook, who introduced himself to me. And Dr. Spomer, this is the first time you introduced yourself to me. <laughs> it's a miracle hat. And I'm going to go take it to another church. Now, of course, that's a fictitious story. I know that wouldn't happen here at a place, but it happens in the church and we're part of the whole church members. We have to take responsibility even in all other churches. You see, it's not that the church is dying, but in some ways, in so many ways, we're failing. Where do we fail? That sacrifice, that offering. Let me ask you this. Would you give up your seat, your chair? Where you sit all the time. For an unchurched person? Yeah, of course I would, Pastor Dreyer. I'd... Do you realize there's some that wouldn't? <laughs> Frozen chosen. This is where I sit. Nobody's taking it. <laughs> I know that's, that's way out there. But listen, there are people. Paul is saying who. Do you realize what you have? The gift, the grace, the mercies of God, the vaccine. He's saying, are you a Christian? If, you, if you're here and you say, yes, I am, I am. Then don't raise your hand. Are you a dedicated Christian? What? Well, that takes some evaluation. <laughs> the good news is this. We can evaluate. We can be remade, rechanged by our God. We can step back and say, hey, I can do better. Don't you evaluate your, your expenses, your debt, your money? And say, I can do better. You evaluate, reevaluate your marriage. Oh, I can do better. Reevaluate your Christianity, Paul is saying. I appeal to your brothers. By the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Wow, that, evaluate, that evaluation starts with the mind. And next week, guess what? Dr. Spomer is going to talk to you about that. You don't want to miss it. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening.